Welcome back to the Tom Hartman Program. I'm Alex Lawson, filling in for Tom. And I want to let you know, all the callers who are calling in, we're going to have a whole hour uh, to take calls next hour. Uh, right now, I want to talk about a really important topic, and then we're going to take calls on everything next hour. But right now, I have a great joy of being joined in studio by Dr. Maya Rockymore, who is the uh, CEO and president of the Center for Global Policy Solutions, globalpolicysolutions.org, uh, and just an amazing activist and, uh, I don't know, leader and... Just everything. We've been fighting on Social Security together for years. That's right. Um, I remember when basically, I mean, like, all the way back when it was kind of lonely. <laughs> right? It was There weren't that many of us who were fighting just against cuts. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, and callers, I know you think I can only talk about Social Security, but I can talk about everything. Social Security and Medicare. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, we're going to pivot, but I have to spend a second on, on this because, uh, you know, like literally there were events. I'm thinking of the steps outside the Peterson summit oh, yeah. with Senator Sanders. I mean, it was you, yep. Senator Sanders, maybe like one other person. You, you too. You were out there. I mean, absolutely. And uh, the people on the inside, Bill Clinton. Yeah, I know. In the right. We were just saying, no, you shouldn't cut Social Security. But yesterday yeah. you were on the Hill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At an event uh, to at a press conference that uh, to introduce a bill to expand Social Security that had 151 original co-sponsors on it, which is like 81 percent of the Democratic caucus. Absolutely. Congressman uh, Lawson uh, introduced uh, reintroduced for this Congress Social Security 2100, which is a bill uh, that basically extends Social Security solvency while also expanding benefits to meet the needs of those who are most vulnerable. It does all kinds of great things. So I was proud to stand with him. And, you know, I just wanted to bring it mm -hmm. up mainly because you've been there the whole time, right? Mm -hmm. Like from you've seen this movement of what happens when you fight with the people and you consistently raise your voice uh, with the people and then the people fight with you. And maybe mm -hmm. D.C. is a lagging indicator, but in, mm -hmm. in time it comes around. And that is where I think we are seeing some pretty good progress. Um, Absolutely. So when I got to Washington, which was in the 1997, uh, one of my first jobs on the Hill was working on the House Ways and Means Committee, Social Security Subcommittee. At that time, you know, the whole notion of Social Security privatization was coming to kind of a head, but we had to build coalitions. And so from that space, uh, you know, in 2005, George Bush announced he was going to privatize and we were on the front lines working with you and others. But after that fight, which we won, we decided collectively that we were going to push for expansion and put them on the defensive mm -hmm. because it didn't feel good to be on the defensive. Remember that? Mm -hmm. uh, and so ever since, uh, we have been on the offensive. And we've been, and, and along the way, we've seen senators and Congress people pick this up. We've seen people across the country start advocating. And it's been awesome to see the power of the people in terms of pushing this. Uh, couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about Social Security, what we're really talking about is economic security. We're mm -hmm. talking about um, the ability of people to have real freedom because mm -hmm. they're not, you know, uh, afraid uh, of not being able to make the next rent payment or mortgage payment or pay for their prescription drugs or anything like that. And I want you to tell our listeners about some of the other work that you do, the summit that you have coming up, the future of wealth. Um, what is it? Because this is all like tied together. It is. We actually define Social Security as wealth, too. It's a public asset. Now, you know, we pay into it through our payroll taxes and our employers, if we have an employer, matches it. If we are self-employed, we pay the, the full amount. Uh, however, um, it's, it's a public asset that benefits our personal wealth. Because if we experience, quote unquote, the vicissitudes of life, you know, if we die and leave children or d other dependents behind, if we become disabled or if we retire, uh, we actually have an asset that can protect our personal wealth from eroding. Uh, and that is the Social Security benefit. Uh, so we consider Social Security and, you know, retirement security generally, any retirement savings that you have as a part of our, our savings assets and wealth. Mm -hmm. So um, 
What is this summit that you have yep. coming up? Tell us about All right. it. So we do a lot around, as you well know, racial um, wealth inequality is a big deal, as is general wealth inequality. But most people don't know that for every dollar of wealth held by the typical white family, African-Americans own six cents, Latinos own seven cents, Native Americans aren't even on the chart. It's sad. Um, and so what we have is, you know, an inequality that is historical in nature, that has been perpetuated through public policy and through private practices um, in terms of wealth stripping. Uh, and, and so what we're trying to do is raise attention to the fact that the reason why these people and people of color are d disproportionately dependent upon Social Security when they retire uh, over a lifetime of work is that, you know, they're economically marginalized. Otherwise, they have very little assets to rely on. And the reason for that is historical and policy driven. Uh, and so this year, we hold this summit every year. This year is going to be in Washington, D.C., April 26th through the 28th. Uh, and we're focused on technology inclusion and social change. The reason why we're focused on technology in the context of wealth is because literally technology is is the the new great you know, industrialization, if you will. This is the game now in terms of if you do not have technological competence, if you don't have some kind of leg up in technology or a foundation in technology, uh, you're literally going to be left behind in the new economy. Not only that, we're finding that a lot of these technologies that are being uh, uh, um, deployed uh, are actually, um, you know, discriminatory in nature. Right. So let's put let's kind of shine a light on that aspect. So. Uh, you an incredibly important point is that you have these uh, historical, you know, the assets that uh, white families have inheritances often that they can rely on, mm -hmm. right? So these are familial things. But then policy-wise, you have generations of policies that go specifically to extend and empower white supremacy uh, or to continue this wealth gap uh, and this divide and it plays itself out you have some things that over time are like can push back against it social security actually has a great effect uh, at pushing back against some of these uh inequalities which is i don't want to spend all my time on social security mm -hmm. they, they always accuse me of doing that <laughs> But it, it, that is one of the myths out there that Social Security yeah. actually widens this. But the opposite is true. It actually is one of the uh, better, maybe best policy at, at narrowing this gap. But sometimes it's a private uh, side thing, right? So it's a business decisions that are made yeah. that are going to continue this divide. Absolutely. And now we're seeing it in technology where technology... Yeah has a diversity problem. Yeah, are you kidding me? Technology has a huge diversity problem. Not If you look at Silicon Valley, it looks nothing like America. Uh, and when you look at specifically the people who are coding and putting these algorithms and everything else together, it's, a, you know, it's a male universe, not not there's not gender balance and and it's primarily a white and, and Asian uh, male universe. Uh, and this is actually having implications already uh, for the nation, because what we're finding is that these algorithms are biased. Uh, they actually have, um, you know, formulas that are biased against low income populations, people of color. Mm -hmm. And, and they can influence everything from, you know, whether or not you have access to credit, uh, you know, whether or not you get hired for a job. I mean, literally, we're now finding that these algorithms that are being come up uh, with by these engineers and technologists are actually having real world implications for populations. And they're having a negative effect in some respects uh, for lower income populations disproportionately of color. I want to keep this conversation going and it because it's really important to also note that it doesn't have to be an active bias that's put mm -hmm. into the technology. It could actually just be that we live in a society where these biases exist Absolutely. and they find their way into te technology that can amplify them. Uh, so we want to keep this conversation going with Dr. Maya Rocky Moore on the Tom Hartman program. I'm Alex Austin filling in for Tom and we'll be right back. You're listening to Tom Hartman. Visit TomHartman.com for audio and video archives. Find out more about the Future of Wealth Summit at GlobalPolicySolutions.org. 